Thank you, Mike. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'd like to start by just introducing myself. I'm Steve Flavel, co-CEO of LoopUp. And um, sitting in the middle of the front row here is my uh, business partner and co-CEO, Michael Hughes. He's the large gentleman, if you spot him later in the, in the, in the reception. Uh, LoopUp is a cloud solution, or software as a solo service solution, if you prefer, for remote business meetings. So conference calling, if you prefer. And we are all about making it less miserable than the world has had to put up with for the last 20, 25 years or so. Um, perhaps your own participation on conference calls might ring some bells if things like all the who just joins when you, you join conference calls, or who's that speaking, who has all the background noise, can you see my screen yet? All of, all of these sort of classic frustrations that have grown up with this now very everyday business activity. A little bit of company background. We, we floated on AIM uh, just about 12 and a half months ago. Uh, the share price is 136% uh, up on that float day. We've got offices in London, San Francisco, New York, Boston, Hong Kong, and Barbados. Uh, there is a genuine reason for the Barbados office. We have a partnership with Cable and Wireless in that region. Um, we've got over 2,000 customers. And you know, the story for tonight essentially is we're in this large market. It's a five billion pound addressable market. It's rife with dissatisfaction. Um, we are growing very strongly, very consistently with a proven product. And in terms of thinking about the future growth potential, we have some very uh, efficient underlying unit economics with which we're returning investment in sales and marketing into recurring annual revenue. So I'm going to share those with you as well. Quick high level to set the scene on the, the sort of the stage of the company. Uh, we did 12.8 million pounds of revenue last financial year, 2016. I think the, the point of this left-hand side really is just to show the consistency of the growth. The, the growth rates in those years were 30, 37%, 36%, 39% on the top line. And as you can see from the interims that we put out yesterday, uh, half one, 2017 over 16 is 44% is 40, up on the top line. So we're continuing that good, consistent growth rate. At a gross profit level, 50% um, up on gross profit, half on half, year on year. Um, that's uh, an, an increase in those gross margins. Our gross margins are now up to 77% of sales versus 74% of H1 last year. And perhaps unusually for, for companies in our space in sort of software as a service type high growth, high growth companies, we're doing this profitably. Um, it's developing, of course, down at the, at the lower end of the P&L, but we are profitable at both EBITDA and operating levels. So a little discussion about the market, um, because this is a hot space. It's a five billion pounds pound space. It has the rogues gallery of enormous tech companies in it. Um, and there's lots of new entrants, there's lots of investment. You know, how come LoopUp, 17 million pound run rate LoopUp, is, is, is competing in this market so effectively, growing at this rate so consistently? What's, what's going on? And, and I think the start point to this is to recognize a sort of a truism about the technology space we're in, which is 25 years into this, into this space, still most people are just dialing in to conference calls with numbers and codes. I don't know if that rings true around the room, but they are not using software for their remote meetings. They're still just dialing in. And the question is, why is that? You know, why has software not come along and given them a better way? Because I don't think anyone would pretend that they like dialing conferencing, you know, punch in lots of numbers and codes. It's not the most popular activity in the world. It's fraught with frustration and annoyance. So why have they not moved to a better way? 
Uh, and the, the, the answer, I think, sort of lies in, in how people tend to adopt software and our use case. When, you, when you're generally, I think, most people, when they're learning a piece of software, it, it's often a process of trial and error. You, you try clicking something and you, maybe it goes well, maybe it doesn't, you've got to try clicking something else. And you know, over, over time, you either pick up a piece of software or you tend not to. It, it's, it's relatively rare for someone to sort of get out the, the manual and, and work your way through it. In our use case, in our space, that's really a difficult thing to do. You know, you're host of this live remote meeting, often with multiple clients or colleagues, and there's just very little appetite for trial and error-based learning. You don't want it to go wrong. You don't want to be the host of this thing that suddenly messes up and you look stupid in front of all those people. You, def you default to the risk-averse option in our space. And whatever one may think about the experience of dialing conferencing, at least everyone can dial a number and put a code in, right? It, it's something everyone can fundamentally do in spite of the poor experience that comes thereafter. It, it's actually even a little bit worse than that because even if you're a, a host of a meeting that becomes relatively comfortable perhaps with a piece of software, what's to say that your guests are gonna be comfortable with that software? It, it, it only needs one or two of those guests to get themselves into a bit of a pickle. And suddenly, you know, you're like IT support on your own meeting, and no one wants that either. And it's, it leads to this state of affairs in the market. Putting it competitively, there's two really distinct playing grounds in this market. This is a sort of framework that's referred to as crossing the chasm, where in many technology spaces, often the most effective way to end up in the mainstream majority of the user base is to delight your early adopters with your software. It tends to spread more effectively into the mainstream majority if you go that route. The problem is, in our technology space, it just hasn't happened. We're 25 years in, and the mainstream majority aren't using any software. They're dialing in. This crossing the chasm hasn't happened because of the risk aversion of the use case. So you end up with a very distinct competitive landscape. You have software competitors, you know, the, the rogues gallery of the big tech giants, down here with some very interesting products that a lot of early adopters love. There's nothing wrong with those products. It's just they appeal to that tech-savvy or specialist user group. And by contrast, there's everyone else. It's a bit of a generalization, I acknowledge, but it's essentially true. Everybody else is kind of the ones that are dialing in and have not adopted that relatively complex software in that risk-averse use case. Our play is really unusual in this industry, and it's why we're doing the numbers we're doing, which is we are the rare software player in this part of the industry. We're doing something that in most technology spaces isn't perceived as a particularly good idea, which is we're targeting the mainstream majority from the word go. Now, in a lot of spaces, that's not a good idea, in our space, it is because of the risk-averse use case and this problem of crossing that chasm. Why is this worth bothering with? What's the pain of Darlin? Sure, maybe Darlin's fine. Well, well, definitely not. I mean, it's, it's certainly annoying. And I think if you have, any of you have seen the YouTube video, a conference call in real life, it does a great job of, of making an amusing situation out of these classic frustrations of conferencing. But more than that, it's an enormous waste of time, an expensive waste of time. 15 minutes are wasted on the average conference call due to these frustrations. That's about a third of the time that people spend on conference calls. And that's an expensive thing. Perhaps more than anything else, what about security? If you don't know, I would venture that who just joined are maybe the three most said words of all time on conference calls. If you don't know who's on, why is that okay? All the money that enterprises are spending on network security, cyber security in general, and it's deemed okay not to know who's on your conference calls. 50% of frequent conference callers think it's absolutely normal not to know who's on their conference calls. It's kind of nuts. And this is our play. 
We are the software product built specifically for the everybody else. And the product for the everybody else is very different to the software products for the, for the early adopters. It has to be extremely simple, almost like Fisher-Price in its approach. You have to guide people through in a very unambiguous way, intuitive, streamlined. And it's all about the experience for LoopUp. It's not about features. In fact, we challenge ourselves not to put features in the product because it will make it complicated. We take the view that done well, less is more with our strategy. And it's working. In the market, 68% of people are still dialing in. In LoopUp's world now, we're up to 75% of people are not dialing in. It's the other way up. We've turned this stubborn industry, this 25-year-old stubborn industry, upside down. A word on our client base and our business model. Um, we target mid to large enterprises broadly across sectors and small business uh, SMEs in the professional services sectors that tend to do a lot of client facing remote meetings. Our revenue model is predominantly pay, pay for what you use. We do offer subscriptions as well and we let customers choose, but pay as you go revenue is 98.5% of our revenue. We have a very well defended customer base. Our single largest customer is only 3.8% of our revenue, so it's nicely defended. And it's geographically well set up for the future. You know, we're not that UK company that needs to go and learn how to crack the, UK, the US market. We've been there from the word go, and the US is just as established as, the, as Europe for us. And the US is important because it's 60% of global demand. Efficiency of growth. We've said it's a good level, it's been consistent, but it's really efficient in terms of return on invested capital. There's two metrics here we look at a lot at LoopUp. Uh, one at the top is about new business acquisition. The one at the bottom is about how we retain long-standing customers. Time is a bit short to really get into the detail of what pods are. Pods, essentially, pods are how we organize ourselves commercially. You could almost think of them as like little mini commercial entities, mini companies, but they have a cross-section of commercial capability, essentially. And we only recruit graduates into pods for the last eight years. Of our approximately 50 pod members, 48 are in their first sales jobs. They, we teach them our way. They learn to not be selfish about sales, and um, it leads to a best foot forward mentality, a very efficient mentality, and also a very self-policing structure. To the economics of pods, in the first half of this year, over here, we had 7.7 .7 pods on average during the half. The annualized cost of those pods was 493,000 pounds per pod. And the return from each pod was £508,000 of recurring revenue that we didn't have before. That then goes on to recur for a long time. Now, please take these next numbers with a, you know, a suitable grain of salt in the, for the technology space. But our loss rate is only 5.5%, which, if that to, were to be maintained, would imply an 18-year life of that £508,000 that only costs 490 to get. You know, these are incredibly efficient underlying new business economics. In our established base in blue, this is all customers that are at least one year old or older, far from what I think would be a norm to expect, which is your established customer base erodes over time, ours is net growing. Put that all together, this was some analysis done by our bank, Pamir Gordon. We have a, a ratio, if you look at the lifetime value of a customer in terms of its gross margin lifetime value discounted at a cost of capital, which I'm not quite sure where this came from, but he discounted it at 15% for some reason. But uh, if you discount future gross margin flows at, um, at, um, at that rate, 
the ratio of that lifetime value of the gross margin of that customer versus the cost to acquire it is a ratio of eight to one. So the present value of every pound that you're investing in this is eight pounds. And then thing above three is deemed a, a pretty good number in the SaaS space. There are some very highly rated companies in terms of their, their multiples that are, that are trading at much lower than, that are returning a ratio here at much, at much less than eight. At IPO, we talked to three strategic priorities for the business. This is just a word on progress against those. These pods are incredibly efficient, and we promised to do more of them. We said we would go from six at IPO last year to at least eight this year and at least 11 next year. In the first half of this year, we were at 7.7 .7 on average, so well on track for our average of eight, given the growth uh, during an average of the year as a whole. Our historic growth to date has come without doing any marketing at all. We don't do any uh, spend on lead generation. And we said at IPO we'd like to change that. So we have now hired the starts of a marketing team, and they've done a, a tremendous amount of foundational work ahead of our starting our, our exploits on lead generation to come. And finally, last but absolutely by no means least, continuing to innovate our product. We compete fundamentally on our product. It's, you know, that, that's what leads to the growth. And you know, it's a moving space. We need to continue to innovate, uh, adding things in carefully, though, into the product, because you don't want to destroy the core flow, the simplicity of the core flow of the product. That said, you do want to integrate with other products so that you play well with other best-in-class products in that enterprise collaboration space. Summarizing the story, so it's been a very sort of consistent set of performance for LoopUp for the last several years. We're showing very strong growth, healthy gross margins, and continuing efficient unit economics with which we continue to grow further. If you, if you look at the, the outlook as well, it's just a continuation of that story in the, in, in the visibility we have. Um, trading in the second half already, even though the second half for us starts with the end of the summer, we're already winning very good accounts. We've won three very significant accounts so far this, this half, um, which are set to roll out during the second half, and, and, and pipelines are really healthy. And, and just to paint the picture of the more medium-term future, we, we have a play in this market that's really resonating, and it's a huge market. When you combine that with the, the efficiency of these underlying unit economics in terms of return on invested capital in distribution, it could be a very exciting future for Leap Up. Thank you very much, and take any questions. Time for questions. Anybody got any questions, gentlemen, just down here? Thank you. Um, just a few questions. Uh, the debtors at the end of the, end of the half year seem quite high compared to your sales. I just wondered how people pay you. Mm. So we, we get paid at the end of each month, post paid for calls made in that month. So it's a very simple revenue recognition model for nearly all of our business. 98.5% of it is that way. So is it, I mean, is it paid by direct debit or anything? Because it, I mean, it looked like you had yeah. about 3.6 3. million of debtors to sales of 8 million. It uh, seemed quite high. Um, so no, it's, it's, it's just post paid. And we, we don't have a, if you look at bad debt on our, on our, on our numbers, it's, it is a very low level. I, I'd have okay. to be, get some more okay. specifics for you as to where that's come from. And, and the spend on, on the developing a product. So over the last, I think, 12 months, you pay, you spend about two million on, on or you, that's but the maximum amount the intangibles have gone up by. I mean, do you expect it to carry on at that rate to increase or to yeah. reduce? So I think you'll, you'll notice that it's actually gone up quite a bit in the, in the first half of this year. But that, that's an indication of the investment we made post-IPO, which was halfway through last year. 
So if you were to look at the second half of last year versus the first half of this year, they're very comparable. We, we do need to continue, of course, to invest in our product, but it won't, the, the rate at which that increase in intangibles or investment in R&D will increase will be nothing like the same percentage of sales. So you know, we have a, a core team in San Francisco that I know Mike would like to enhance carefully over time, but there's not big step jumps needed in that team. Okay, so, but given that you want to keep the product quite simple, um, mm -hmm. am I just surprised that it was that sort of level? Of spend, but. We have a very full roadmap of things we'd like to do with the product. Um, there are things we want to build into our own product that we don't have currently. We have to do that very carefully, you know, challenge ourselves on whether we should build them in for a start, and we very often decide not to. But there are a number of things we want to build in. I'll give you a few examples. But we, we're going to do these things very carefully, and they tend to get built in at the end of the flow rather than as part of the flow. I'll give you an example in terms of video for video conferencing. You know, most video conferencing products make video part of the entry mechanism. When you try and join the meeting, it guides you through a video join process. And most people don't want that most of the time. Neither does the host want their guests randomly being able to join by video or not, in our space of the market at least. In, in the other space, it's quite different. In our enterprise space of the market with the, the mainstream majority users, they want, they want video occasionally, but much better to offer it as an option after they've got themselves on the meeting and feel comfortable on the meeting than try and force people through it on the way through. And it's an example of how we will implement video versus how most products implement video to try and not compromise the simplicity of the core flow. Similarly, you don't want the host to get in a pickle. You, you, want, you want the host to be able to say, OK, now I'm going to in enact video on the meeting. You know, it's, it's a different concept to how most video conferencing products work. And, and the usage of video conferencing in multi-party situations is very small, and this is part of the problem. It has a very high usage on one-to-one, point-to-point interactions, but not in our world of multi-party. And just finally, when people in your pods go along to a potential new account. What are the objections that the account, potential account might raise as to why they won't use Lupin? Hmm. So um, I think that the story resonates widely. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's, it's occasional but rare that you get denial that there's a problem in the industry. That said, the, the biggest issue we probably have is that they're not expecting an answer to come along. This has been going on for years and years and years. They don't expect a company to walk through the door and change that. It's, it's an industry that's, that we're trying to disrupt, and, and they don't expect the disruption. So one of the biggest challenges we have is we're, we're perhaps not expected, and they have to find room for our project. So we go to a lot of pain to try and explain to them how simple that deployment is and how painless it will be for them, particularly using capabilities like we have now with single sign-on and, and things like that. But it's, it's important to get that in early and up front so that they're not thinking it's a big project. Um, OK, uh, thank you. Yeah. Gentleman over here. Um, sounds fascinating. I haven't come across your product before. So could you explain a little more about how it actually works? Yes. If I presume the host has some software, does he does the host initiate the call so the the guests just receive a phone call? Yeah. So the 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 flow of a loop up meeting it probably starts with the host needing to get an invite out for guests. Most of our customers are Office 365 users, so they use Outlook for their calendaring and invitation sending purposes. So we have a little add-in for Outlook, and if the host wants to get an invite out to guests, it is literally two clicks from our add-in in Outlook, and they have a nicely formatted Outlook calendar appointment with all their loop-up details ready to send out to guests. And this is very indicative of, of the loop-up philosophy, which is it must not require any training. And you know, it's, it's sort of you know, those two clicks you couldn't train people on. Out goes the invitation. We do have dial-in information in our invites because you have to. You can't just 
make people go cold turkey on Dahl in. It's, what the, it's grown up with the industry. You have to have it in. It's kind of table stakes. But we encourage people through the way that invite is formatted not to use those Darling credentials. There is a link, and a guest, any of your guests, can click that link. And if you click it, it asks for your name and number, which is memorized for next time. And then LoopUp immediately calls out to you on that number. Okay, so it's LoopUp calls you rather than you dialing in. And that's the thing that's used on 75% of the time now on, on, our, on our metrics. And we obsess over that number because what happens next? Yes, it's a nicer join method perhaps than dialing in. Loop up calls you after a click or two. But what happens next is key because you're naturally dropped onto a web page where you can see all the guests that have joined. You can see who's speaking. If someone's got background noise, you can see where it's coming from and you can click with one click and mute it. If you want to view what the leader is sharing, it just shows up. You don't have to do anything else. <laughs> and and this, is, this is what I mean by no training required. You're sort of guided through this flow where everything makes sense in the right order and where you don't get confused about what should I do next. Does it link in easily with... I'm, I'm used to using Skype occasionally. Yeah. Um, I, I don't use video conferencing. I haven't for a long time. Um, but I know my son uses it all the time. Yep. And um, what, when, using a mobile phone for, for conferencing, does, it autom does your system automatically bring up the image of the host and possibly other people yep. on the conference on your mobile Thanks for raising, because maybe I haven't been clear enough on this. So we are not a video conferencing product. <laughs> uh, we're an audio and web conferencing product. So you can have a conversation, multi-party conversation, and you can share stuff with your guests. You can show them a presentation, share a document, show a website live, but you're not all looking at each other. Uh, a sort of PowerPoint presentation yeah. would be presented to all the guests, but the guests Absolutely. can't feed in at that point? Only with the host's permission. By default, it's the host <coughs> sharing to their guests unless the host decides to open it up for others to do the same. More questions? There's a lady down here. Oh, Chris? A lady I might take you here. up on this because I, I'd, I'd like to understand it a bit better. I, I was phoning in to, um, uh, well, I think they'd better remain nameless this morning on a, on a, uh, on a phone-in to... Um, talk about some results. Yeah. Uh, and um, I saw that the link was loop up, and I thought, oh gosh, how interesting. Uh, now I'll find out what it's all about, because I'm going along to see them this evening. Uh, and all I did was I dialed in, uh, I then dialed the code, I put hash on the end of it, and I was in an audio um, meeting, like yeah. any other meeting that I've ever attended um, by dialing in. Yeah. Uh, what my experience was no different to anything that I've experienced in yeah. the last 15 years. Yep. So what weren't the um, hosts doing that they should have been doing? Or why are you different? In view of what you've just said, it sounds as though um, the people who were hosting my uh, phone in this morning were mm -hmm. not giving me the information that they might have on my screen. Yeah, it sounds like that's the case. So right? okay. that, that if they sent you an invitation that just had dial-in numbers and access codes in, it that's did. not the idea of Looper. Okay. Right. No, the normally right. formatted invitation leads with a very prominent link. Right. So you're right. encouraged not to dial in, and people are not dialing in most of the time. Um, but clearly they didn't put that link in for you, and so you had no alternative. Is that because they're trying to save money? Is it cheaper? No, actually it's the other way around. There, oh, is, really? there, is, there is a false opinion that dialing out to, to you is more expensive, and that, that relates to a historic sort of thing which is that used to only be possible by operators doing it right. and therefore it was expensive. These days with the way you can control industry switches it's actually that all goes away and the underlying economics of dialing out to a guest is cheaper. So you know, we're actually, you're actually able to save a lot of money and in some countries it's, it's orders of magnitude like India and China you can save an order of magnitude of money by going that direction rather than tra traditional dialing. Oh hi then, thank hi. you. Um, I tune into a lot of webinars 
And I just wondered, how does this compare yep. to something like um, uh, Go Webinar? Yep. Uh, are they similar, or how does it differ? So if you're if you're running or participating in relatively simple webinars, maybe LoopUp is suitable for you. But really, we're not a product for webinars. We're, we're a product for important day-to-day -day multi-party meetings. And it's, it's a big volume in the market. Sometimes webinars need capabilities with, with more features. Perhaps you want to uh, have the ability for guests to chat or something or annotate what you're showing or you want to run a poll after a certain module to see what they made of the last module. And you know, this is the sort of feature creep that scares the non-webinar <laughs> use case. So, you know, we would not put ourselves out there as a product for webinars, unless they're particularly simple webinars. Thank you very much. Thank you, Steve and Mike. Thank you. Thank you.